Join you. Let's open our Bibles. Let's go to the book of Galatians. Uh, so if you've been with us in the past weeks, we've been going, making our way through the book of Galatians and... Um, We're at chapter 4, midway through the chapter and as you turn there, let me begin by saying this, um, this letter to the Galatians has not been an easy ride, has it? You know, it certainly wasn't for the Galatian believers because the Apostle Paul was responding to believers that were moving away from the simple gospel of God's grace, of God's salvation. They were moving away from the forgiveness that is found in Christ's atoning sacrifice upon the cross. They were moving away from that and they were adding law and ritual. They were adding things to do to the faith of believers to try and find acceptance before God. And I know we, we, we've looked at this week in and week out now for a few weeks. But um, again, I must say, because I think it's relevant today, these words of this book, because there is a part of us, and again, I've said this, there's a part of us that wants to earn, that needs to earn, that wants to in some way be able to justify ourselves or justify a reason for why God accepts me. And you know what the Bible says. You know what the Bible says about your righteousness. You know what the Apostle Paul says about the state of our being, how that none is righteous, no, not one, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. You know that a salvation has been wrought or won for us, the free gift of eternal life given to us through faith in Christ. And that's it. And that's it. But there's something in me. And as I've said in previous weeks, there are entire religious systems that have been born on the premise that that something in you wants to lift itself up above that truth or even place itself alongside of that truth to say that, yes, I am worthy. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But he is, isn't he? He is. And the Apostle Paul is defending this truth, this gospel of grace with all that he has with all of his life he will defend that grace that truth to the day that he lays his head upon the upon the executioner's table to lose that head he'll defend it because he knows that we cannot earn he knows that we cannot buy this wonderful gift of salvation so what he's been doing he's been speaking in plain he's been speaking in extremely strong terms hasn't he I mean, he's told them the foolishness of their error. He's told them straight up that they're listening to deceivers. He's told them straight up that they are flirting with notions that are so very dangerous to their spiritual well-being. It's been difficult making our way through this book. But you know what I love? Now that, and, and we need that, please don't misunderstand me. But now that we come to the fourth chapter... There is a distinct change of mood halfway through this chapter. And the, ship, and, the, and the scripture, what it does, it shifts from the accusation, the accusation of, 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 our, of, our, of, of men's at false attempts and failing attempts. It shifts from that accusation. It shifts from even the defense of the gospel, even shifts from the persuasion to try and turn people around. And now what we hear in these words is the cry of the apostle Paul's heart. We hear the pastor's heart. I mean, all the way through, it's been the pastor's heart. But now we're hearing this passionate cry of a dad for his children. You know, it's a wonderful passage we're in here this morning because his scorching words, they give way to warmth, they give way to tenderness. And again, it's this parental concern over the distressing sign of the ill health that has found its way into the hearts and the lives of his spiritual children. I, I, um, I've said to you, thank you, I've said many times that um, I admire the Apostle Paul, as I say, above 
above all, probably above all men that have walked on the face of this planet. You know, he, he, has, he faithfully preached the gospel in the face of the, the most fierce persecution. You know, to be stoned, no, we don't need to go into it. Just read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and you'll understand what I, what I mean. About what Paul endured for the gospel's sake. And he truly is, I believe, the greatest of all men. But you know what? Having said that, and I've said this many times, I probably wouldn't like to be around him all the time. And not because of any fault in him at all. But simply because he would not in any way have the truth of God's salvation compromised. He just simply would not stand for it. He would not allow the cause of Christ to be endangered in any way. And you know what? That includes believers that were giving themselves into social pressures, that were surrendering the purity of God's truth. Christian, if you stepped out of line in front of the Apostle Paul, then don't expect him to turn a blind eye like so many liberal believers would today. No, that just wasn't in him. It wasn't in him to surrender the purity and the power of God's word, the love of God's compassion and mercy to mankind. It just wasn't in him to surrender it. And if you doubt that, when you get to heaven, go to the, go to the apostle Peter and ask him, because he'll tell you firsthand. So it's wonderful now, knowing that about him, it's wonderful now to have this insight into the warmth and the tenderness of this great defender of God's gospel of grace. So are you with me? Let's, let's read verse 12. I hope you can hear the heart in the man today. We won't go very far, but he says, Brethren, I beseech you, for I am... I, I beseech you, be as I am, for as I am, you are. You have not injured me at all, he says. You know, literally, quite literally, it's brethren or it's, it's brothers, it's my family. It's beloved family of God. I beseech you, I beg you, become as I am, because I also became as you were. And please understand, he says, you have done me no wrong. Understand that, he says. You know what he's saying to these believers? He's saying, you know me. Essentially, that's what it is. You know me. And I want you and I to, to hear his heart this morning. You know, he's saying, you know that I am free from the bondages of the law. You know who I was. You know who I was as a Pharisee of the Pharisees. You know how I was committed desperately and, and, and absolutely to keeping the law of God. And I even, you know, he will tell us that he, that he persecuted the church in defense of the, the law of God. You know who I was. You know how passionate I was about keeping the law of God. But you also know who I have become. You know how I've become. You know that I'm free from the bondage of the law. You know that I'm free now from trying to earn God's favor by keeping rules and, and keeping regulations. You, you know that because why? Because as we just read, because I became like you, a child, someone not bound by the Jewish law and traditions. You know who I am now. You know that I gave up all those time-honored Jewish customs and associations with being a Jew. And I became like you, he says. I became like you who were by nature not under the law of God, who were naturally not under the law of God. What's he saying? You know my journey. He's saying you know my journey from legalism to grace. You know how God has worked that in within me, within me, and you have seen me live it. You have, you have heard it from me. You understand these things. He's passionately crying out to their hearts what they know about him because the way that they are behaving towards him is not reflective of the truth of who he is and the relationship that they had. But the relationship has changed. And so he's saying, you know me. I mean, we go back to, to Acts chapter 21 and just let me read this to you because it talks about how many thousands who had been zealous for the law, as Paul was, 
believed when they heard him preaching that they should forsake Moses, telling them that not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. Thousands have believed. He said, you know the testimony of my gospel of grace that has been given to me by God. You understand these things. Again, he preached it to them and he lived it before them. He lived the freedom that the gospel of grace brought to his life and their life. Again, you know it and he's pleading with them. Do not abandon this freedom. Do not let it be taken from you. You know, that, that, that was first received. If you want to know the history, you, can, you go back to the book of Acts in Acts chapter 13. And that's when they first came across the apostle Paul. Let me read it to you just for a bit of background here. He was speaking at Antioch and we're told in Acts chapter 13, and I'll, and I'll pick it up halfway through because it says in verse 38, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, he's referring to Jesus Christ, through this man, Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And he says, gives a warning, beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of by the prophets for the prophets had said behold you desire you despises and you despises and wonder and perish for i work a work in your day god says a work which you shall in no wise believe even though a man declare it unto you the work of god's forgiveness through christ jesus and he says, and when the Jews were gone, this is what I want you to hear. And when the Jews were gone, because Paul was rebuking them for rejecting the gospel message, but there was another group of people listening from the, you might say, from the peripherals of that scene. And that are these Gentile believers that he's addressing in this book of Galatians. He says, but when the Jews were gone out of the, at the synagogue, the Gentiles, these guys, begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. They heard the words of eternal life. And when all the rejectors and the naysayers of God's grace had departed, these Gentile believers came in and they said, Paul, we need to hear this. We need to hear this truth about God's grace. Please come back and preach it. And they did. They begged and he came back and he preached it to them. And they believed and he became their spiritual father. Please hear the heart of this man. He became their spiritual father. And they saw firsthand after that how the Jewish believers expelled him from the region for preaching those to them that they believed. They saw it. And so again, he's saying to them in this passage here, you know me and you know the freedom that we have in Christ. You pursued after that freedom as each and every single one of us have pursued after that freedom. So the appeal again is to maintain the freedom of the gospel message in our lives. But it's incredible, really, the irony of everything that's going on here in this passage. Notice again, he became like a Gentile, set free to no longer have to try and please God, to no longer have to try and earn favor from God by keeping the law of the Moses. He was set free from that. But these Galatians who had been free by nature, you might say, and that they were never under the law of God, were now believing that they had to become Jews or had to become like Christ themselves in order that they might be saved. They believe they now had to come under the law. And the irony is simply this. Paul is telling them just to be yourselves. Just be what God has done in you. They were Galatians who had been saved by grace and who did not need to change their identity before God. Do you hear that statement? They were Gentiles who had been saved by grace and they did not need to change their identity before God. That's the sum total of this book. You are saved by grace. Your identity is established before the presence of God. He looks upon you as how, people? Righteous, forgiven, accepted in the beloved. 
And as we saw from the book of Romans the other week, he no longer, no longer attributes sin or unrighteousness to your account. So it's wonderful to be a child of God, knowing that not only are we saved, not only are we forgiven, not only are we in God's perspective pure, holy, we will never ever be unclean. That's the wonder of God's grace. We will never ever be unclean. Yes, practically, there is a righteousness that's going to be worked out in our lives. And the longer we live and the closer we get to Christ, you know, the, you know, the, the more we will forgive, right? The less we will sin and the more we will forgive. You know that statement, don't you? You become more like Christ. You sin less, but yet, even as you come more like him, you still need more forgiveness because you recognize just how far from him we always were. And the wonder of his grace and his salvation just becomes more enormous to us. That he has forgiven us. And he has set us free from it, you know. So here is the incredible irony that Paul faces with these people. You are Gentile believers who are saved by grace. And you don't need to change. You don't need to add to it. That's the sum total. So Paul says, I beg you, become as I am because I also became as you are. Let us stop here for a minute. I know we know this truth. But let us stop here for a minute and consider just how wonderful it is to be like the Apostle Paul and to be able to say to anyone, have you ever said it? Become as I am. Have you ever said it? You know, every single one of us should be able to say that. Become as I am, especially to unbelievers. It kind of arrests your, arrest your heart for a moment, doesn't it? To think that you would stand before someone and say, become as I am. But hang on a minute. Have we not found the answers? Would you answer me this morning? Yes, we have, right? Do we not know absolute satisfaction in Christ? Yes, we do. Does not the forgiveness of the salvation of God bring joy to our beings and rest to our eternal souls? Does it not? Are we not free? Yes, we are. Oh, yes, we are. But you know what? There's a world out there. There's a world of people out there that are trying to deny the struggle of their conscience. The struggle that their conscience is having with the corrupt morality of this society. Now, they may tell you it's getting better all the time out there. They may tell you we're getting smarter all the time. We're discovering more wonderful things all the time. But the, I'll tell you. Within the, within the conscience of every man, woman, and child out there, there is a struggle that faces the corrupt morality of this society. It's there. They may oppress it. They may try and disguise it. They may even deny it and live in ignorance of it, but it's there. It's there gnawing away at them, you know. They know society is a cesspool. They know it. They witness it and they experience it every single day. In their lives, just as you see it every single day. They know that their kids, their children are being molded and shaped by nothing less than wickedness. They know it. They see it on the TV. They see it being, exp 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 they see it being forced into the education system. They know it. They know it. But what is the world saying? The world is saying what you and I need to say. You know that? The world is saying become... As I am. The world's not afraid to say it. I mean, the world's all about it. Become as I am. Become as who we are. Become as everybody is. The world is saying it all the time. And their struggling consciousness or the struggling consciousness of mankind out there is muffled by, the, muffled by this fool's rationale. And it is, isn't it? It's a fool's rationale. It is what it is. And it is what it is because everybody else is doing. We may as well just, that's a fool's rationale, isn't it? And the conscience of man is muffled by it. But I tell you, if we were to be just as willing and just as vehement as the world is to say, become as I am, to stand up and say, become as I am, 
be free from sin as I am. Be free to find and follow God's grace, God's peace, God's love as I am. Be free to follow God's mercy, God's forgiveness, God's acceptance. To follow the peace and the hope and eternal security that has been born in my heart become as I am. Oh my, if we would be brave enough, if we would be willing just to stand up and say it, become as I am. He's not saying stand up and say, become a sinless, perfect person. No, none of us can say that. But if we would just say, if we would just live, if we would just be what it is that Christ has born within us, I believe that that muffled conscience within the lives of so many people would be awoken to the hope of glory. Don't you? Isn't that what happened in you? I know that's what happened in me. But I've just got to say it. Just got to live it. Just got to believe it. Just got to show the experience of it in my life to everybody out there. Maybe not in those words. You know, I've been asked to walk around, become as I am, become as I am, become as I am, like a robot. No. But again, I'll say it. If Christ in you is the hope of glory, then why would we not tell it? Why would we not live it before them and boast of it as the Apostle Paul did? Boast of it. Paul says to these Galatian believers, become as I am. Become as I am because I became as you were. You have done me no wrong. You've done me no wrong, he says. He's saying these things because he doesn't want them to feel, and this is a good lesson, he doesn't want them to feel that he's saying the things to them that he's saying because they have upset him or hurt him or injured him in any way. He's saying these things because he doesn't want them to think or feel that he's saying them because they are listening to other teachers, to other voices. He's he's saying these things to them because he doesn't want them to think that he has spat the dummy. No, he wants them to know the great concern and love that he has for them. That's why he says, so you have done me no wrong for me to say these things to you. I just want you to know that I love you. That's our message to this world, isn't it? Become as I am because I love you. I want you to know the freedom in Christ. I want you to know the liberty that I experience. Peace and the hope that God plants in my heart. In fact, you know, the Apostle Paul, he goes on here and he speaks about how graciously they did receive him in the first place. And how they made it abundantly clear to him that that his visit to them was such a great blessing. This is the relationship they had with him. He would say they received him like an angel, like a messenger from God, like like Christ himself. That's how how the, the relationship began with these people. But now, read these verses with me. Verse 13. You know... How through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at first. And my temptation which was in my flesh you despise not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and had given them unto me. He's saying that you love me so much that you would have done anything for me. That's the relationship we had. Now, let me pause for a minute because I've got to deal with something. I do not know, nor can I know, what this illness, what this infirmity was that Paul speaks of. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel to you at first. I do not know, I cannot know. And just as I do not know, nor can anybody know what this illness was. If you want to chase it, there are a lot of smart men out there, much smarter than I, 
researched the history and the locality and the experiences of the time that have come up with all possible sorts of diseases that the Apostle Paul had when he arrived at the Galatian church. You know, people talk about malaria, they talk about epsilon, they talk about a repulsive eye condition, they even talk about depression, and the list just goes on and on and on. But as someone said, It's hard enough to diagnose a living person, let alone diagnose someone who died 2,000 years ago, right? It's a great statement. But the fact remains is Paul doesn't tell us. But what he does tell us is that it was because, please hear this, because you are confronted by this in the church. He does tell us it's because of the infirmity that he preached the gospel to them in the first place. Please note that God used illness. Hear this, please. God used infirmity in this man's life, the Apostle Paul, to take him to the areas of Galatia so that the gospel would be preached, that these churches would be born. It's quite a lesson, isn't it? Quite a lesson in life. Now, only stop here because there are people that are going to tell you with condemning words that if you have infirmity in your life, why? It's because of your sin or it's because of your lack of faith, right? You hear that often within the church. That's completely opposed to the gospel of grace and everything that the gospel of grace represents. Paul here teaches Otherwise, he here teaches, you know how it was through my infirmity that I preached the gospel unto you in the first place. All I know is this, people, because I'm, I'm, I'm asked these questions all the time, but all I know is this, people, if God lays you low, then he lays you low for a purpose. If God is Lord and God is sovereign, then he's Lord and he's sovereign, right? He's in charge. He's in control. He is the boss, we like to say. You have been brought with a price. You are not your own body and soul. Your entire being belongs to God, physical and spiritual. We must understand that. We must understand that. And all I know is, I'll say it again, if God lays you low, it's because he has something to do. He has something to show you. He has something to work through you. Yes, it may be to glorify his name by you being miraculously healed. That is true. And I don't dispel that and I don't argue against that. And I pray for people all the time. But it might also be to stop you in your tracks, to sit you still, to open your eyes to the reality of something that's going on in your life. It might be to open your eyes. Whatever it is, we surrender to the sovereignty of our God. And Paul says the sovereignty of God brought illness to the Apostle Paul that the gospel might be preached and the churches of Galatia would be born. That's the truth here. Now, why is Paul talking about this? Why? Well, read verse 14 with me. He says, And my temptation trial, that is his trial, which was in my flesh, you despise not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. In other words, when I arrived, I was just a mess, Paul says. I was a complete mess, and there was nothing about my condition that was appealing unto you. Now, let's be honest. Can I ask you a question? Will you be honest with me this morning? You're sitting in a room, and you're waiting for something. But as you're waiting for something, somebody walks into that room. You see straight away as they come through the door, their skin is pale white, pale white. They are sweating profusely and they are coughing up a lung. Terrible, you know, and you see them. They enter into the door and they stand there and they look around the room that you're sitting in. And there's a chair sitting next to you and the chair on the other side from you. What's going on in your mind? What's going on in your heart? What's going on? I know what's going on. Please, God. Please, God. Let them sit over there, right? But they don't. 
They come and sit next to you. And they turn to you and say, good morning, how are you going? With an extended hand of fellowship. What's going on inside of you? What do you do? I only ask the question because Paul says that's the such a way that I came to you Galatian believers. I came like that, but you embraced me. I came like that, but you didn't reject me. You didn't despise me. You accepted me. Not only that, he says, you received me as an angel from God. Is Paul going too far with this statement? No. You received me as an angel from God. In other words, they saw him as the messenger of God, someone bringing God's message. Even more, you saw me as Christ Jesus himself. He's reminding them that when he came to them, that they received him. No, more importantly, they received the message that he had as coming in the authority of Jesus Christ himself. In other words, he's saying, you got it. When I came with the gospel of grace, you got it. You understood what the gospel message was all about. Therefore, it became the most important thing in your life, the most important truth that you can receive. And isn't that true, Christian? Isn't it? Isn't it? Of all the things that you have received in your life, of all the knowledge that you have acquired, all the wisdom that you have ascended, into all of that in your life by far the most important is the truth in what that christ died for your sins and rose again for your justification that's the most important truth that's paul's point here you've had it you loved it you lived for it but look at what he says next this is where it gets very tragic where is then the blessedness that you spoke of? What's he saying? He said, where's the love? What happened to the love? For I bear you record. If it had been possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and you have given them unto me. Which is, you know, again, there is nothing that you wouldn't do for me. But now, verse 16, I therefore become your enemy. Why? Because I tell you the truth. So the relationship that the church of Galatia, the, the churches of Galatia had towards their, their pastor, I'm going to talk about myself in a minute, has gone from you have brought the most important message, you have led us in the ways of truth and everlasting life, you have allowed our eyes to be open to the glory of God and the purpose of God for our lives, you have shown us destiny. And what it's all about. And it has gone from there to the fact that I am now your enemy because I tell you the truth. My, isn't it tragic? Can you hear why his heart is just broken for these people? Now, as a pastor, I need to say some things here that I think are very, very important from this passage. And it's not something... It's not my revelation. It's something that I've heard pa another pastor, David Guzik, teach when he was going through this passage. And I think it's so important. I just, I just need to share it with you this morning. And not important for myself. I must stress that. No, not at all. But let me start by quoting what John Calvin said. Calvin said, It is not enough that pastors be respected if they are not also loved. Both are necessary, otherwise their teaching will not have a sweet taste. So if this is your church or if you come from another church, it is really important that you go to a church where you can both love and respect your pastor. And the reason is that a good pastor loves the church enough to always be giving truth, the truth. Knowing that Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, what? And the truth will set you free. You see, my job as a pastor is not just to make you feel happy every Sunday morning. Not at all. It's not my job as a pastor is not just to make sure that you leave this room with some sort of warm, fuzzy feeling every week. No, not at all. 
My job is to faithfully, as I can, give you God's life-transforming word. What does God say about his word? Not so much, right? The one thing that he exalts above his name, Psalm 138. You know, we could now go into a study of 119, Psalm 119, if you've got a couple of days to see what God says about his word. But you know what he says about his word in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16? He says this, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness. I love what Warren Wisby says about those words. He says this, Scripture is profitable for doctrine. What is doctrine? He says, profitable for doctrine, what is right? It's profitable for reproof. That is what is not right. It's profitable for correction. That is how to get right. It's profitable for the instruction in righteousness. That is how to stay right. So you could say that a preacher's job is essentially to point out what is right, what is not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. You know what that means? That means that when you come to church every week, it's not always going to be a comfortable feeling. It's not always going to be a comfortable experience. Sometimes, quite frankly, it's going to be decidedly uncomfortable. And that is for no reason other than the fact that the Holy Spirit is taking the Word of God and He's touching your life somewhere. And if you don't love, this is why it's so important, and if you don't love and respect your pastor, then there's a good chance when those uncomfortable days come that you're going to say, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Now, as a pastor and the pastors of this fellowship, we need to earn that love and respect, right? Don't we, you know? And the Bible is full of exhortations in the Scripture to teach the elders and the leaders of church not to lord it over people, but to be as a servant. Because that's what all those words mean, right? Don't they? They all mean the same thing, to be a servant. And as I've said to you many times, as the leaders within the church, we do not come to lord it over and be above, but no, our position is where, you've seen me do this so many times, is to be down under and to lift up, to come up from underneath. So we must earn that love. We must earn that respect. We must be faithfully, prayerfully and sacrificially given to feeding the flock of Christ. We must be. But it's as Boyce said this. I love what Boyce said. He said, ministers should not be received and evaluate on the basis of their personal appearance. That's good to know. I'll start again. Ministers should not be received and evaluated on the basis of their personal appearance or their intellectual attainments or some winsome manner, but as to whether or not they are indeed God's messengers bearing God's word in Christ. Paul says to these Galatian believers, what happened to the love? Just because I'm telling you the truth, You now regard me as an enemy? That's what it's come to. And Paul wants them to see that their attitude towards them has changed because of the people they've been listening to. He says, they zealously caught you. They, who are they? Who are they? these Judaizers that were insisting that the Christian believers need more than just faith in Christ to be saved. They jealously caught you, he says, but for no good, yes, they would exclude you. They would separate you. They would, they would isolate you, that you not might be zealous for them and them alone. But it is good to be zealous, he says, it's good to be zealous courted always but in good things and not only when i'm around paul says you know i'm on the verge of launching into something right now that i think i need to stop and leave for next week because he's talking about these false shepherds that are coming in and courting god's people 
And God's people are listening to them. And because they're listening to them, they're allowing themselves to be isolated from the true source of the gospel, to be separated from the, the, the flock of God that feeds upon the word of God, and they're in great danger. That sounds like a good Bible study, doesn't it? All right, let, let's leave it there. Are you happy to leave it there? And, and, and let's pick it up there next week. Paul says, become as I am because I came as you are. He says, live in the freedom of the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let us visit again the place where that was realized in your lives. Let's gather around the communion table. So as the uh, elements are passed out and the worship team comes forward, let's take a moment to consider these things today. Let's take a moment to steal our hearts now. I want to read you a story as they come forward. It's one John MacArthur told. <coughs> he tells of Lawrence Arabiator. Arabiator. That's <laughs> well, it's late. Thanks, Jim. He tells of Lawrence... I can't say it now. <clears throat> Arabia participating in the parents' peace, Paris peace talks after World War I. He was trusted, this is Lawrence of Arabia, he was trusted by Arab leaders who were staying in the same hotel. Now, these leaders were astounded to discover what seemed to be, now remember, this is back in 19, the mid-1940s. These leaders, sorry, World War I, this is the uh, 1920s. These leaders were astounded to discover what seemed to be unlimited amounts of water that would flow simply by turning the handle of a faucet. They'd never seen a tap before. And they were amazed by it. They were so taken by this that when they left their hotel room, they removed the faucets and packed them into their luggage, believing that that's how you get the water. And these, are, these are Arabs. They live in the desert. I mean, it's gold, right? This thing, greatest invention ever. So they, they, they took it off and they packed it in their luggage. And when they told Lawrence about this, he explained that the faucets, faucets were no good if they were not connected to pipes that were connected to a supply of water. MacArthur aptly states that the person who is not connected to the son is not connected to the father and he has no source of spiritual life or power. He then concludes by saying, let us or let us thank God for the privilege of being his child through faith in his son our Saviour, Jesus Christ. You see, the Apostle Paul in this book is facing this great challenge where people are placing things to do between Christ and the believer. Things that they think are going to bring them a closer, more intimate relationship or a greater acceptance of God. Like taking the faucet off and carrying it with them, these guys believed that they had the source of life. And many believers today believe if they would just do this or if they would just do that or they would continue in this or if they would stop doing that, then they would have a greater handle on the source of life. That's not grace. You know this. We've been talking about it for weeks. Grace is found here, right? In this cup that's in your hand. In this biscuit that's in your hand. And I just want to ask you this morning, Let's just take a moment to still our hearts and to remember the day you stood, that first time you stood at the foot of Calvary's mountain and you looked up at your Savior and they saw for the first time the reality of the truth that he was there for you. He was there for you. And you stood at the foot and received that forgiveness. There was nothing between you and him. As the blood flowed down and touched the ground, the ground you stood upon, it reached you. It touched you. It cleansed you. Nothing else. Nothing else. 
Never let anything come between you and that precious blood. Let us lift our heads this morning. Let's look again upon that cross. Let's hear those words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Let's accept that forgiveness. Let's stand in the midday sun to recognize the incredible... No, please forgive me. Let's stand in the midday darkness to recognize the incredible price that God paid for us. by taking our sin upon himself, by experiencing the eternal wrath of hell himself in some spirit, in some way that's beyond our comprehension in those hours upon that cross. He took it for you and I for us to finally hear those words to tell us die. It is finished. The price is paid. What a wonderful picture, isn't it? As the ground shook, His head was bowed and the ground shook. The ground was shaken. The earth was split and the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom, signifying to all mankind that the way into the presence of God has been made open for all who would believe, all who would accept his forgiveness, all who would understand the atoning value of his sacrifice, all who call upon the name of Christ shall be saved. Shall be saved. Are you the saved this morning? Are you the saved this morning? If not, all you need to do is ask. All you need to do is receive His forgiveness. And nothing will ever, ever get in the way of the completeness of that work. That's the passion of the Apostle Paul. For we here who are saved today... We live with a gratitude that we cannot express in words. So we simply bow our hearts and lift our heads and say, God, thank you. God, I praise you. God, I'll live for you. God, I want to honor you. Show me your way. Be my strength. Be my light. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the completeness of it. And we thank you for men like the Apostle Paul and countless other martyrs who have given and paid the ultimate price that this truth might be brought to us. Oh, Lord, this truth that we might live before men, before people, that we might boldly, boldly say, become as I am, free, forgiven, full of hope, full of destiny, full of peace, love and joy. God, we thank you. Use us for your glory. Thank you for this shed blood. Thank you for this bruised body. Help us to see it in a fresh way today. Help us, Lord, to to become more than we were than when we walked into this room. Jesus' name we pray. Amen.